a great pleasure for me to uh, welcome Professor Yanis Alimonos from the University of Maryland at College Park. Uh, Yanis was my former advisor and he's uh, the director of the Computer Vision Laboratory at uh, Maryland. And uh, he's well known in the vision community for his work on active vision and uh, his discovery of the trilinear constraints in multi-view geometry and uh, a lot of his work on omnidirectional cameras, motion estimation, many things, among others. So uh, over the last few years, Yanis has been uh, very interested in creating uh, linguistic representations of human actions in uh, various spaces, like the motor space or the visual space, and of course, the natural language space. So, he's, so, that, so today's talk is going to be pretty much about uh, his work on uh, modeling actions. Uh, before I hand it over to Yanis, uh, one little note. Uh, so anybody who wants to ask questions, uh, if you could please uh, ask them at the mic over there, and uh, they'll get recorded for, uh, for the video. So thanks over to Yanis. Hey, <coughs> thank you very much, Abhijit. Uh, I must tell you, uh, after Abhijit left Maryland, we have been suffering. We still haven't recovered. Uh, this is the truth. Uh, it is real, it's a real pleasure to be in this uh, Google land. Uh, and my research has been in vision for the most part, but I, uh, I have been interested uh, in theories of the mind in general and in intelligence for a long time. And when I uh, decided to come here and speak to you guys, I thought that it would be more interesting if I speak to you about something that is in your future business. Uh, and by that I mean meaning, meaning. Because right now, Google is doing an amazing job of finding information by matching A with A and B with B. Uh, you cannot really go into the meaning of the texts that are around because the community is very far from meaning. So uh, <coughs> the title of this uh, talk has, is an introduction to the Poeticon. The Poeticon is the name of a project that is funded by the European Union, uh, where I participate with a number of universities and institutes, ranging from the Max Planck Institute in Germany to the Italian Institute of Technology, where they develop humanoid uh, robots. Uh, so, let me start very quickly with a preamble, so that I don't get, you don't get lost. And then, I have something for computer scientists, something for engineers and physicists, and something for the cognitive scientists. And by the way, I'm very happy to have in the audience Professor Tom Dean, who is one of my co-authors. We have co-authored a textbook in artificial intelligence, which still sells. If I say, Tom, run to the store, you understand it. Well, how do you understand Tom? OK, not so important. Tom. Store. How do you understand run? What does it mean to run? You're going to go to your lexicon, and you're going to look it up. So you realize that run is from this run. And if you look it up, you find move with quick steps faster than walking. Uh, then you have to deal now with move. You have to deal with walking. You have to deal with the rest, but let's concentrate on these guys. And then, well, how about walk? What is walk? You look this up, too. Walk is to move by putting forward each foot in turn, not having both feet off the ground at once. It's pretty amazing definition. And so on. Now you realize that we are in trouble already, big trouble. However, you also realize that you don't need anybody to tell you what run is. Why? Because you have run. You have seen other people. You have seen other people run. You have run yourself. 
you know what it means to run. You have sensory motor experiences of running. You remember it. And you know what it means. As a matter of fact, if I ask you to give me a definition of walking or running, you're going to have trouble because you never thought about it. Because you have an intimate understanding of these actions. So that's what I'm going to talk to you about. That you can take the lexicon, which is what the linguists have made after thousands of years, and you can augment it. You can enhance it. You can enhance it. You can make it very powerful. How? By putting inside it things like run, but run like in another space. You're going to put a representation of running that involves vision or involves your muscles, your motor system. Now, as I said before, it has to do with your ability to remember sensory motor representations. Now, these sensory motor representations, the sensory motor experiences are things that today we can measure. How? Well, it depends what you want to measure. I'll tell you what we are measuring. We have these suits. Now we got a better one. That this is give, gives you what the graphics uh, and animation people call motion capture. It gives you a sequence of the join angles over time. And then we, using that, you can produce a movement. Now, this is not exactly muscles, but it's very close to it. You could measure muscles. It's going to be much more expensive and much uh, more complicated. Uh, but if you have motion capture data and you have a humanoid robot, to give you an idea, you can program the controllers to move the robot in such a way so that its motion is like the motion capture data. So motion capture data is not optimal, but it's good at this stage. Then you can also get uh, the images that you see. And also, you can uh, use uh, tracking devices so that you can know where you look inside those images. You can also put uh, sensors in the hands so that you can have touch. Uh, and then, this is what the philosophers and cognitive scientists have referred to as grounding, grounding meaning, to connect symbols, language, with the sensory motor structures. It's like the first step towards grounding. Now, let us say I'm looking at someone doing something. And I understand it. Like I see somebody walk. I understand this. That's because I possess visual representations that allow me to proceed to such understanding. But at the same time, I can myself perform an action. I can see you walking. I can walk myself. I can see you jumping. I can jump myself. Don't give me examples about paraplegics now that are looking at actions and they understand them. We can deal with that later, OK? But also, I can say walk. Now, this, this, and that are the same thing, an action. But this is in one kind of space that people have been studying for a few thousand years. This is another kind of space that people have been studying for 30, 40 years. And same thing, this is another kind of space. This is the space of the mot motors, the muscles. This is the visual space. This is the language space. OK? Now, the linguists have told us that there exists structure in language, in natural language. We are not 100% sure about exactly what that structure is. 
but it has the general name grammar of some sort. There's grammar in language. Now, can you imagine having a grammar for this space and having a grammar for that space? That would be very cool. You know why? Because since this is the same thing, what you need is you need translation mechanisms to go from one space to the other. And you got to do this very fast, too. And if I have a language that describes this space, and if I have a language that describes that space, since here I have a language, then I would be able to go from one language to the other if I can translate. The mirror neurons is one of the biggest discoveries of our times, in my view. It happened about 15 years ago by accident. The mirror neurons are neurons. Actually, one of the problems that they have is that they have the wrong name. They gave them the name mirror neurons. Uh, what are the mirror neurons? They were discovered in the lab of Giacomo Rizzolati in Parma, in Italy. And one of his students at the time was Luciano Fadiga, with whom we collaborate in the Poeticon project. He is now a professor at the University of Ferrara in Italy. Mirror neurons are neurons in the monkey. They are also in the human. But they were originally, uh, they are in primates in general, uh, discovered in the monkey. And these neurons. They have the following property. They are active whether the animal is performing a task or whether the animal is watching somebody else perform the same task. Do you see the difference? In other words, whether the input is coming from the vision system or the input is coming from the motor system, that neuron is going to be active and is going to say, grasp. Grasp, and I don't care if this is visual grasp that I see somebody grasping or if I grasp myself. This is grasp, abstract. So what the monkey is doing, the monkey is having abstract representations of action. Because that neuron or that cluster of neurons that represents grasping, it has pointers to the visual grasp and has pointers to the motoric grasp. So anyway, what this means, let me give you another example. It may be relevant to you. The community of computer vision is trying to recognize humans in action, video from video. It's the big brother problem. You have videos, and you want to find out what people are doing. And the community is doing only one thing. They are basically tracking. They are looking at the problem as a visual problem, and they are trying to track every part of the moving human, hoping that that's how they will understand what he is doing. But what the mirror neuron story is telling us with hundreds of other experiments that I cannot go through here uh, is telling us that when you, the human, when you recognize somebody else doing something, you do so because of an internal act that recaptures the essence, which means when you see the movements, you transfer this to your own coordinate system. And then in your mind, you, can, you do the same thing that this other person is doing. But in your mind, you imagine it. You think about it. What does that mean to think about an action? An action is movement of the limbs, goals, changing things. Etc. But one of the important discoveries in uh, cognitive neuroscience over the past 30 years has been the fact that we have representations for action that are such that we can think about them without actually performing the action. This is very important. Because if we have a hierarchical framework, if we have a hierarchical structure to represent human action, 
then that hierarchical structure basically lends itself naturally to thinking about that action at different levels, like at a high level. When you are at the leaves of that tree, then you have the actual stuff. When you are at the top, you are abstracting. The same way that you do with sentences in language. So the basic thesis that we formulated a few years ago, and Abhijit was part of this, and some of these ideas actually originated from him, that actions are characterized by a language. It's a new language that has its own phonemes, its own morphemes, and its own syntax. Well, you know, it, it, it doesn't take long to realize that speech and human action are very similar to each other. They both have a generative and a recognitive component. You can speak, and I understand what you say, but I can speak too. You can do an action, and I understand what you did, but I can do it too. These things are parallel to each other. So the hope is that we can use technology that has been developed for speech for this problem, either in a thematic sense, yeah, or not. Speech is an action, absolutely. Speech is an action. Speech is something that happens because you move your tongue and your mouth in a particular way. And I have some interesting news to tell you. If I forget, please remind me regarding this. Uh, so, and then, you know, the project Poeticon studies meaning as emerging from the integration of different types of representations that refer to the same entity. And the integration of representations that refer to different entities, but collaborate in forming concepts at different levels of abstraction. So, when we talk about actions, there are many things involved, ranging from intentions, goals, movement, objects, and so on. And there is a very large amount of literature in psychology, cognitive neuroscience, robotics recently. And people have offered lots of th interesting theories, like schemas, Michael Arbib, functions, modules, and so on. Uh, now, before I tell you what we'll try to do is, let me give you, just give you the action representation sort of unit. Intention, <coughs> inverse model, efference copy. When the brain sends a signal for you to do a movement, that signal not only go to the, goes to the appropriate place so that the movement can be executed, but the copy is kept. It's called the efference copy. It's pretty interesting. Why would you say that the copy is kept? A copy is kept so that the system can do the internal simulation. Because up to now, up to now the movement hasn't happened. You have the intention, then you have the efference copy, and you can go use a forward model and predicted feedback. And this is the simulation internally of the action. You can keep doing this as long as you want. But then, boom, you can do the movement, and now you can start getting actually sensory feedback, which you can compare with this. Now, it would be nice if we can have a mathematical framework that uses this thing as a unit, but that's too hard. So what we will do is we will concentrate on the movement. We will concentrate on the human movement, and we will attempt to build a language out of it so that we can have a language that describes any kind of movement. That would be our goal. We are still not there yet, but that would be our goal. And what w would we do? How would we approach this? Well, the word that we are using is, I guess, something. I don't know if you are using this word. Probably you don't. But that's what you do. It's hyper-empiricism, using gargantuan amounts of data that either exists or that you can collect fast. This is what hyper-empiricism is. And this is the Poetic uh, Consortium. OK. And of course, uh, 
there's all these basic questions in cognition on uh, like for example how is what is a concept do the particulars of perceptual and motor systems play a role in concept definition let me diverge a little bit uh, because now that we are trying to build this we are coming close to the difficulty of what a concept is what's a concept when I say to you, Apple, what is happening? What is going on in your mind? Or if your system, your artificial system understands Apple, how does it do so? Is there some kind of a predicate, logical representation? It says Apple, it's a fruit, it has this color, it has this, that. What do you think? What is an apple for you? You don't really know. We don't know. But uh, it's a big problem. It's a very big problem. My students are refusing to consider that there is a representation for Apple that is there. They say, no. What you can do is you have sensory motor experiences of apples. You see an apple now, an apple later, you see lots of apples, you touch them, you smell them, you eat them, you taste them. All these are experiences, sensory motor that you have with apples. If you collect all of them, which means you have to have this amazing capability every time you have a sensory motor experience of an apple to go and put it on the right place. Yeah? How would you say the physical experience of soul? How would that? How would I say? How would you hear the concept soul? Soul? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Your colleague there is trying to create problems for my simple framework before it even started by going into the so-called abstract words. Okay? We're going to deal with abstract words later. If we can deal with apples, then we'll go for the abstract things. If you see the children that, as they grow, takes them a long time to understand what soul is. Actually, I still don't know myself. <coughs> so, what is the point or some kind of a thematic scheme here is that we could achieve artificial intelligence that has been our dream through measuring human behavior because by collecting all these characteristics from a behaving human through this hyper empiricism idea you could learn a very large number of things that we were not able to learn before and now you may say why humans if I have an intelligent system that is different but remember, the intelligence systems of the future will have to share some conceptual uh, set with us. We have to mean similar things if we are, if we are to uh, make progress. Okay, so now I'll show you an example of a language that we call HAL. That was uh, the thesis of my student, uh, Gutenberg Guerra, who is now a professor at the University of Texas. Uh, very quickly, an example on language grounding. If you read, if, what, what does that mean? Pelé scored the most beautiful goal against Sweden in the 1958 World Cup final? And now watch Pele number 10, always the master and the scorer of goal number three. All right. Okay. So, for the next uh, 10 minutes or so, I'll show you how from data you can get to what we call HAL. Uh, HAL stands for Human Activity Language. And we have various ways of capturing this data. Here are some examples that are done optically. Uh, so that you can develop these models. Uh, let me jump over that. 
Now, this is what I was telling you before. And this is some good news in the sense that as we study this problem, if we don't manage to get what we want, or if it doesn't come soon, in the way we are solving problems that are uh, at the heart of today's technology. Many industries and many, many entities are interested for like controlling robots with natural language or annotating video. So since we go for a language, what do we have to do? Uh, if you study linguistics, and I have to admit that I am an accidental linguist myself, if you study linguistics, then you find out that linguistics is, uh, for the most part, about three things. What is called phonology, morphology, and syntax. And there is, of course, semantics and pragmatics and so on. But morphology has to do with how you get going to the signal and pull out, I mean, phonology, you, you pull out the phonemes or the primitives that exist. Well, it's not clear what the phonemes are in speech from what I read. But people have been making a lot of progress in this problem. Now, we're not going to have phonology because we don't have speech. We're going to have kinetology. But kinetology amounts to finding primitives inside. Morphology will have to we, will be the set of rules that will take these primitives and put them together into morphemes or words. And syntax will be the set of rules that will take these morphemes and put them together into something that makes sense. Now this is the data from the suit. Here what you have is joints, like abdomen, feet, knee, etc. And here you have time. And in every row, you have at most three angles. That is the representation of an angle. This is the motion capture data, as the angle changes over time. Basically, this tells you what the body is doing. And you can already see that it doesn't look hopeless, because you have a lot of uh, uh, correlation. I mean, look at that. You have these columns. I mean, many things. May, what happens in one joint happens. Similar things happen in other joints. That's one observation. OK? Now, imagine that you are an archaeologist, and you find a papyrus, which is like this. And it is four miles this way. And then you say, you know, this is, this is text in a language. And you got to find what the language is. It's a learning kind of problem. Grammatical induction techniques exist in the literature where you can give them examples from things in a language, and they will try to come up with a grammar for the language. There are simple techniques, very powerful, and there are very sophisticated techniques as well. And what we have done is not optimal, but it makes the point. So just like in linguistics, you know, you have, you have, an, inf uh, you, you have an interface between phonology and morphology, you have here too. In other words, this process is not one, two, three. I do my phonology, then I do my morphology, and then I do my syntax, and I'm done. Because they are happening together and they are influencing each other. So let's see. So this is a, examples from data, uh, like the right angle. Okay? And it's a very simple way of making this data discrete, with, of course, all the difficulties that come afterwards. But anyway, this will give you the idea. Uh, now, you can take this data and look at the derivatives. We painted the derivative, the places where the derivative, first and second derivative, are positive or negative. So you have four cases, four colors. Doesn't look too good here. But this is a viable scheme, let's say. This is a simpler one. If the function goes up, you make it blue. If it goes down, you make it red. 
Now, this up and down is not, uh, this wouldn't work for any kind of signal. Because here, it has a meaning. Up means the angle is increasing. Down is decreasing. It has a physical meaning. The going up and coming down has a physical meaning. Okay, it has a physical meaning, closing, opening. So <coughs> what you can do then is you can turn your signal into these rectangles, the blue and red rectangles, where one of the dimensions is time and the other is the difference in angle. Okay, and these are going to be basically your phonemes. So in other words, uh, you take your initial data and you turn it into what you can call an action gram, which basically every row has become a string. Now you feel more comfortable uh, if you are a computer scientist because you have strings. Now this is the computer science domain. And the thing is, if you are able to discover structure along each row, that's good. And if you are able to discover structure between rows, that's good. So you're going to have two kinds of structures. Uh, this representation has interesting properties like reproducibility. This is a database from NIH. These are workers. And uh, you can see that the, the, the sequence of phonemes for this join, this is one join over time, is the same. These are different people, except this one, Wilkie. <coughs> selectivity. You have to have selectivity properties, like the one walk should be different than run. It should be different than jump. Okay. These are other examples from a database. Uh, actually, you know, we have, we have about a thousand actions that we have collected that are annotated, like sit, run, hit, punch. And we have lots of hours of unrestricted free behavior. Uh, but there are other databases too, which we try to capitalize on, like one from Carnegie Mellon. This is the joint hip for walking. And these are the, the numbers correspond to different subjects in the database. And you can see uh, the ultimate goal that we have, this is a very similar experiment, is to, so basically these are the kinetic teams. Let me give you this so that you can get a, oops. So this is one, this is another one, this is another one, this is another one. So in other words, if you take that data and you get your rectangles, the blue and red rectangles, this is what they co will correspond to. So you have to solve the symbolization problem because when you go to the data and you're going to get this rectangle, this guy, you know, it's not going to be exactly the same like this guy uh, or like, like that one. They will have differences. And then you have to perform... Uh, some interesting pattern recognition techniques here. Uh, what Gutenberg used was uh, hierarchical clustering. And you have to end up with, you know, saying this is the same thing like this. So here we put letters to, to, to denote that these are specific kinetims. Okay? And, you know, now you can do uh, this technique where you can uh, build this grammar. We we'll show it as a tree here. Uh, by going through the data and... Uh, I don't remember actually the name of this technique. You probably know. If you have two symbols that one of them is after the other and this keeps repeating, then you can take these two symbols and replace them by another one and keep going. Uh, there are interesting properties in decompression that are not so important. Here are some morphological experiments that I'll uh, uh, go through quickly. Now, let me give you this example from parallel learning. Here is one join. Here is another join. Not only we have to get a, a, a grammar here and there, but we also have to find out when things in different joins happen at the same time, because that's very important. These are the so-called synergies. So 
So here is the execution of the algorithm, and after some po after the uh, after some point, we start introducing nodes for uh, rules for variables that are happening at the same time in the two different joints. Now you have to realize you have to understand that something like that is going to be happening for all for all the joints. It's very difficult to show, but you build this structure uh, that is basically telling you about rules that are executed at the same time in the different joints. Let me show you quickly a morphosyntactic experiment. Uh, this is, see, he says bow. This one action called bow. Here is Kerchi, crouch, kick, kick wall, kneel, limp, and so on. And this is one joint, the data for one joint. And now what we can do is we can induce a grammar for that joint out of all the actions. The basic point is that all the things that human beings do, they have components that are very similar to each other. This is where the grammar is coming out. Okay, and you can see this in the trees. This is one rule. Don't worry about the fact that this is a bit uh, fatter than this. This is for the scale so that things can fit in the same page. But this is the application of a rule, the blue guy. And now another rule, and the red rule, and so on. And we keep going. And as we keep going, we keep building this. Uh, what comes out is the arboreal structure of the human movement, because you have parts in different, uh, I mean, you have sub, subgraphs, subtrees in the different verbs that are the same. Syntax. Well, this is what sort of learning in a linguistics class. But in our business here, a noun is either a body part or an object. A verb is the action. An adjective, which basically modifies a noun, is a posture. This is an adjective for my hand. This is another adjective for my hand. Uh, adverbs that are the most interesting. Adverbs, they modify the verbs. So I can walk. I can walk a sad walk. I can walk a happy walk. I can walk in many different ways. All these different uh, characteristics that I have, the specifics, they are adverbial information. Now. The syntax here is more complicated because you have parallel syntax, because you can walk and wave. These are two actions. Uh, or, and you have sequential syntax, where you do an action, one action after the other. So if you have parallel actions, you cannot do them if they share essential actuators. If they don't, you can do them. Uh, now. <coughs> Adverbs. Adverbs is a very complicated uh, topic, very hard. Uh, maybe I'll go through and uh, come back later. Parallel syntax is interesting because out of the database, you can build this, this, this map. Here you have the joints. Here you have the actions. These are verbs here. I'm sorry that they couldn't make them bigger. But every column has a 0 or a 1, depending on whether the, 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 particular, the, speci the particular joint participates in the action. So by having this structure, now you can do interesting uh, graph theory, find subcomponents, clicks, various kinds of aspects, and find things that you basically can perform in parallel because they don't share actuators. For sequential syntax, in order to go from one to the other in the join, from one action to the other, you have to have the appropriate kinetim. Like if I have these two actions and I put them together, because uh, they don't share essential actuators, each one of these guys is an actuator, as you see. This is easy to do. 
But if I have, let's say, this situation where I share these actuators and I want to put them together, now, you see, I have B. I can do it. So B will be my transition point. <laughs> and I can start with this one or the OZO and jump to B, then go to X, Y, or this S, etc. And I can go from here to there and then up or down, depending. I can mix the actions. This is, so this is a word. Now it's a little ugly. I know this is not the best language, but at least uh, it's a language. <laughs> so basically, the way to show it is these are all the joints. And these are the grammars on the joints. But I, we don't show the stuff that is inside here, the simultaneity. Uh, OK. Now, let me show you quickly something that uh, is basically following this, this work. And it's based, again, on the ideas of my friend Abhijit. Uh, where what you would like to have is you would like to have a grammar of motion synergies. What's a synergy? Like as you sit, don't change, put up a little bit your right leg and start rotating, start rotating uh, the foot clockwise. And now as you do that, as you do that, with your right hand, try to write the number six in the air. You cannot do it. You just cannot do it. Try all day. You will not do it. Why? Because this synergy does not belong to your repertoire. You don't do that kind of stuff. Now, the brain cannot generate a large number of independent control movements. It cannot do that. That's why we cannot juggle. <laughs> you need to be a special guy to be a juggler. So after a lot of learning, and of course, and a lot of effort, you get to it. But it cannot. So all these complex motions that you do when you perform actions is basically very simple. The brain has figured out a way to do that. So somehow, we have to develop a grammar of motion synergies, of these things. And I, you have to see what a synergy is. Now, if you have such a grammar, it would generate a string of control symbols, and then a planning mechanism to put them together. And then finally, you will get some coordinated kind of signal that you will put to the particular uh, effectors. And the cool thing about this, which I think this, this is, I have very high hopes for this learning experiment, uh, is you can do the same thing. Uh, you don't have to put this on the actuators. You can put them on another space, and in this case on an image, so that you can learn the appearance of action. And you can also do two, two things, things in parallel. And you know, the, you also have the, uh, the property of the motor equivalence. Because I can do this with my two fingers. I can also do it with my lips. Same action, different effectors. Uh, so, so the idea would be to start with uh, joint angle data, develop the synergies, get the control functions, Build the grammar. Uh, so let me go, show you an example. This is myself. It's myself, right? Where I'm stationarily jogging, and I'm trying to move my hand like this in a different frequency than my jogging. You know, difficult to do. But you, you, may, you may manage to. So this is my data. The joint angles over time from the suit. 
And this is a similarity matrix. Okay, so basically, what are we going to do? <coughs> Every row is a 1D function. Okay, and a synergy is a set of rows where these 1D functions are spectrally similar. If you look at these functions, they have the same spectral content, it seems. They are very similar. You saw them in the previous example. Uh, so then, how are you going to discover them? One way is to, you know, multiply the Fourier, the, the Fourier transforms, okay? Uh, you basically compute the similarity matrix. Actually, that slide came before, so I, uh, where was it? Yeah, here. Uh, so you, when you have these angles, actually there's a, an error here on this. But uh, you can compute this if SI and SJ are two of these series, uh, then you can compute the similarity matrix. Replace here this, this guy with the Fourier transforms. Uh, so, so what we can do is we can do this and develop the similarity matrix. And after you do that, you find you have three groups. The dark blue, which is not moving. The red, which is group one, my jogging. And the green, which is group two, my rubbing. Yes. Is there a representation of gravity in this? Um, are these joint angles relative to an assumed uh, gravity vector? Yeah, you should have that. You should have that. And I'll tell you later, in the third uh, reincarnation of this, uh, how this is taken care of, but not here. Uh, so this is group one of the synergy. Uh, <coughs> and these are the movements. Now, what does it mean? It means that all these functions are very similar to each other. That's what it means. Very, very similar. So, what we would like to do is find one function that can generate them all. One function that can generate them all by changing a few parameters every time. Okay? Uh, and so that's that function. That's that function, which basically amounts to this wavelet that will be our control symbol. This is the other synergy with the movements, and this is the other wavelet. Let me summarize. Your grammar is going to put out control symbols. These are these guys. Okay, out of these control symbols, you're going to make these functions. Now, this function can can uh, produce every function in the synergy with this rule, for example, here, where you have parameters, translation, scale, amplitude, the DC shift uh, out of this control symbol, and you can get this function. These are, of course, always approximations. Uh, and now, after you have that, uh, your coordination mechanism is going to give it to the appropriate joints. So that has a, very, a big number of advantages. Uh, and, well, I'm getting, uh, let me see. Okay, I guess I got to hurry. Now, out of 400 actions, by cross-correlating every joint in any action, with any other join in any other action, you get something like 13,000 vectors. Now, if you do a PCA of this space, you're going to find about five eigenvalues. That's pretty amazing. We cannot use it yet. It just says that the things are very much related to each other and the dimensionality is very low. OK, this is the next thing that we're going to do. This is you can buy. This is a company that actually you can rent it. It's a, it's a model of Stanley. Stanley is a 56-year-old male in California. 
uh, I don't know, maybe he's around here somewhere. Uh, and it's, it's a model, and these guys are muscles. So this is a musculoskeletal model of a, a human where they have measured all the masses and, and not a very large number of parameters. So if I have motion capture data, I can get that guy to do all these motions. And now you can attempt to find a grammatical uh, framework that relates the muscles because this must, I mean, you have, now it will involve forces because you have to pull the muscles. But it would be much more realistic uh, and generative. Uh, this is pretty good, actually, physical simulation. Pretty amazing. Okay. So now, as we coming to the end, I'm going to tell you about uh, semantics a little bit. A little bit about semantics. And especially since my friend uh, Tom Dean is here, uh, I take the opportunity because I have a number of questions. Maybe he can give me his wisdom. Uh, well, semantics has, is related to purpose and intentions. You know, there's so much literature on these uh, topics. And I won't uh, go for it. Uh, okay, here is to remind you about the development of the praxicon uh, through these experiments. And now I want to get to this big experiment that we are planning. But we are very careful because we are not 100% sure of how this is going to work out. Uh, and you will understand what I mean because it has to do with how we learn the conceptual system. Because if you look at children and observe them, although that literature doesn't have too many results, the children learn some things before they learn other things. So if I have a system and I want to teach it the conceptual system, how am I going to do? Am I going to give everything at once or do I have to do it in stages? Anyway. The grounding experiment, you have actions. What are actions? Actions are verbs. Where do you find them? You find them in the lexicon, in the dictionary. They are there. As a matter of fact, be, be, beyond the dictionary now we have, we have the word net. I don't know how familiar you are with it. We have the frame net, which is like the word net on steroids, as they say, that has much richer descriptions and many models of actions. But what you have is, trees, basically, because of the hierarchical notion of planning that, that we already know. We understand that. Now, down here in the bottom layer, you have sensory motor data. And what you want to do is you, you want to make sure that you have a path from these guys at the top to some guy at the bottom. If you have a path, then you have grounded this thing. If you don't have a path, you haven't grounded it. You may have some understanding of it, like we have for liberty and freedom and passion and love, but this is not the same understanding that we have about apples and hands and tongues. So <clears throat> we have given the little title of behavior on experiment. This is just locally, just for ourselves to, to communicate with each other. But the idea is that you can imagine that you have a very large amount of data. This is the data. What is that data? All these things I was telling you before, including video. And you have here the word net or the lexicon. And now you annotate this in some way by asking people to give you I mean, there's many ways of doing the annotation, and I don't want to uh, deal with that right now. Uh, but coming back to concepts, as I was telling you before, the view that the neuroscientists have today, or many neuroscientists have about concepts, is that they may be just the sensory motor correlates. What the concept is, is the redness of the red and the smell of the, of the apple, sorry, I mean the, the concept of an apple 
is a set of its sensory motor correlates. Okay. Yes. Isn't that what Damasio claims emotions are? Just sensory motor correlates? Damasio claims that? Emotions. Emotions are very important, yeah. But he claims that they're just sensory motor correlates. But emotions? Yeah. Yes. They could be. It, I don't know. I saw an amazing uh, video uh, last uh, yesterday in Pasadena, a a, an embryo, a fetus, in reconstruction with two sonar beams. And I was moving its hand over its face, and the, this guy was studying the development of you know, haptics and this and that. But you could already see emotions in the face of the three-month-old fetus. Uh, okay, these are experiments from these neuroscientists. This is an experiment that we have been doing, and I'll tell you about this, and I will be concluding. Uh, here is two people in the lab. I think one of them is Abhijit. Is it you? Maybe not. Okay. That's, no, 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 no. It, it, it's a much uh, newer experiment. Okay. So uh, this guy is going to give a book to this guy. So he comes, walks, boom, he gets says the book, then he turns around and leaves. You have witnessed the intentional act of giving. Um, now, you can imagine that if we have this data, and we have that data I was talking about before, okay, and we can go and build this structure that for a lack of better work, we'll call it a semantic network that you're all familiar with. Below each one of these frames, you have a description of what's happening, like the spatial layer, uh, P1 is person 1, right-hand surface, uh, you know, left leg surface, book surface, and so on. So basically, it describes the scene in the, in the form of a semantic net, each one of these. Now, what, does, what is give? I mean, if you look up some AI books and stuff like that, where you try to find a predicate for give, what is a give? Give x, y, z. X gives to y the object z. When x has z till some time, then for some time, t1 till t2, they both hold the book. And then after time, t2, the first guy doesn't hold the book anymore, and so on. Okay, it's more complicated because the, the face here is important because uh, you may give the book or somebody may grab the book and so on. But nevertheless, if you take this definition for give, then you can find it inside here. Because give, this, this, is, this part, this subgraph of the semantic net is the one that says what I just told you. So, so the possibility exists that you can go to the sensory motor soup, which is up here. You can, through formalisms of structure in that data, develop a description. And in that description, you may find, you may find definitions of abstract verbs, like give. OK. So I hope that I have raised your consciousness about the possibility of utilizing sensory motor experiences to enhance our understanding of language, because this is the ultimate. Uh, we have the visual space, the motor space, and the natural language space. And in order to be able to relate them, what we have decided to do is build languages for this. And that's the only thing I talked to you about today. I didn't talk at all about this. This is much harder, maybe next time. But the basic idea is that if we structure, if we develop structured descriptions of actions in the visual domain, in the motoric domain, then you can even use machine translation technology as long as you can do the proper alignment to go from vision to motor, from motor to vision, from motor to language, 
to just go around the spaces. So I wish you good luck with your work. And I hope that at some time in the future, maybe I'll be very old at the time, that I'll be able to search the internet with queries that have to do with meaning. And you guys, you will have this amazing software that will go out there and structure all the texts in the world depending on their meaning. Because when you have this big structure of the lexicon, enhanced with the praxicon, it would be very difficult to miss the meaning or you know, to miss the sources of information that have that. I mean, uh, if, if you try to you know, do specific things you know, in linguistics, this ambiguation, for example, is, is a field topic that many people are working on, it can happen, it can happen with the praxicon. Many other things can happen with the praxicon. Uh, now, one of the things that I didn't talk here is that the praxicon has also information about objects or could have information about objects because objects are participating in actions. Now, if you think seriously about the idea of developing a version of the praxicon that has also visual information about the objects in the world, then you are elevating the lexicon and the praxicon to a new level. And that level is coming closer to your business, especially when you try to put the whole world uh, in a structure and uh, you know, find it. So, I think I have to stop here, and I want to thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.